Uh, I'm John. Like I said, I'm one of the pastors here. We are in the book of Acts, and we're at um, Acts 17. And as we come to Acts 17, let, us, let me remind you quickly where we're at. The gospel is now radiating outward to, uh, from Jerusalem to Antioch up north. And now we're in the middle of the Apostle Paul's uh, second missionary journey as the gospel now moves into Macedonia or Greece and then, and then Europe. Uh, Christianity originated as a Jewish sect, and as Pastor Joe looked at the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15, now it's the full inclusion of the, of the Gentiles without having to become a Jew first. And then last week, Pastor Josh looked at Acts 16. As the gospel moves outward into the world, there is absolutely no one who is beyond God's grace. Absolutely no one. So now let's focus on two sections in Acts 17. Uh, we see what pa Pastor Josh described as the gospel spreads, communication of the gospel that leads to opposition, uh, the saints persevere, and then some are saved. So in verses 1 through 9 of chapter 17, when Paul and Silas passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia to uh, Thessalonica, a strategic city in Macedonia, Paul did what he normally did, and that was to go first to, to the Jewish synagogue uh, to preach Christ. Some Jews were convinced uh, that Christ was the Messiah, as well as some God-fearing Greeks, and then some important women in the city. But a crowd opposed uh, to Paul's message rioted and attacked a house owned by Jason, who was a believer who lived in Thessalonica, and forcing Paul to, and Silas to go west to the city of Berea. So let's pick up the story in verse 10. As soon as it was night, the brothers and sisters had sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. Upon arrival, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. The people here were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica, since they received the word with eagerness and examined the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Consequently, many of them believed, including a number of prominent women as well as men. But when the Jews from Thessalonica found out that the word of God had been proclaimed by Paul at Berea, they came there too, agitating and upsetting uh, the crowds. And then the brothers and sisters immediately sent Paul away to go to the coast, but Paul and Silas stayed on there, and those who escorted Paul brought him as far as Athens. And after receiving instructions for Silas and Timothy to come as, to him as quickly as possible, they departed. Uh, the Bereans, we note, were more noble in their character than the people in Thessalonica. And this had to do with their thinking. Now, there's a great scene of the Blues Brothers, because it always comes back to the Blues Brothers, doesn't it, right? There's a great scene of the Blues Brothers where the guys are, are recruiting the old band, right, pulling the old band back together again, right? So they go to this cafe where Matt Guitar Murphy is working. He has an apron on. They urge him to rejoin the band, and his wife, played by Aretha Franklin, is upset that he's ready to jump ship and uh, go back to his former life in the band in wonderful musical form. She sings a song that she made earlier, famous earlier in her career, called Think. She wrote the song amidst her failing marriage to Ted White, but when the studio finally got around to releasing it, it was a month after doc, Dr. Martin Luther King's assassination. And so the song was a personal cry for Are from Aretha about her personal freedom, but it quickly became an anthem for civil rights as people began to sing the chorus, think about what you're trying to do to me. And they sang it as a form of cultural protest. So in Acts 17, we have two examples of how Christians are to think. The first is this. We think devotionally. Dr. Luke describes the character of the noble, uh, the, the uh, noble character of the Bereans as receiving the word with 
eagerness. Now, we might call this passion, but not so much as getting fired up or like this emotional lift or zest, but passion as a keen interest in something, like laser-focused. They were eager, and then they examined. Now, the word examined is a legal word, meaning that they thought through what Paul said as a form of cross-examination. They reasoned through each of Paul's assertion and then compared them to the Jewish scriptures, the Old Testament, and they began to connect the dots of the gospel. Old Testament, now to the New Testament. The Holy Spirit's work is to transform us internally to make us look more like Jesus. And these are called moral virtues. In other words, simply put, more of Galatians 5 erupts out of the heart, right? And these moral virtues help us love God and love our neighbor more. Love, joy, peace, patience kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Besides that, our minds must be formed as well in order to think. We often talk about this 18-inch gap between our head and our hearts. And so what Christianity is trying to do is to turn us into the kind of person whose heart and mind are united. We become a person of integrity, a whole person. So the ancient Christians believed that in order to live well, you had to think well. Let me say that again. In order to live well, you have to think well. They thought that following Jesus as a disciple included cultivating virtues of the mind or what's called intellectual virtues. Here's a few. Curiosity as a disposition to wonder and ask why. Intellectual humility as an admission that you might be wrong. Mental attentiveness being mentally careful or thorough, making distinctions, being fair-minded, taking your time to not rush reflection, and intellectual courage that led to conviction. So maybe you've heard this before from some people. You know, I'm a rational person, but you're a person of faith as if somehow faith and reason were opposed to each other. C.S. Lewis wrote in Mere Christianity that before you go to a doctor for an important operation, you find out everything you can about that doctor. You speak to your doctor and former patients. You check Google reviews. And finally then, based on the evidence, it's reasonable then for you to have faith or trust that she's a good doctor. But on the day of the operation, you panic and you cancel. Did you lose faith because you thought it through? No. You lost faith because you stopped thinking and listened only to your emotions and your fears. Faith is not opposed to reason. Faith is not opposed to reason. Lewis wrote further in Mere Christianity, faith, in the sense in which I am here using the word, is the art of holding on to things your reason has once accepted in spite of your changing moods. So the scriptures tell us repeatedly to think, to examine, to renew our minds, to reason as a part of what it means to follow Jesus. In 1 Corinthians 2.16, we are told that we've been given the mind of Christ as a gift in salvation. The Bible uses the word dianoia for mind. And it means your faculty to rationally think through. John Piper wrote, 
Serious thinking is a means of loving God and people. It is to reject either or thinking when it comes to head and heart, thinking and feeling, reason and faith, theology and doxology or giving thanks to God, mental labor and the ministry of love. Piper goes on to say that thinking is the way that we put the fuel of knowledge on the fire of worship and service to the world. Do you get that? that? That thinking is the way that we put the fuel of knowledge on the fire of worship and service to the world. That's great. The problem, though, is that in our modern day, we have inherited an aversion to thinking or reasoning. For instance, what's a pat answer? A pat answer is an assertion that lacks any substance or doesn't make good distinctions. It's simply an assertion of truth. For example, the statement, good people go to heaven. That's a pat answer because People don't have to think about what they mean by good. What does it mean to be good? We get pat answers and we give them to others to avoid thinking. So uh, a person that I'm indebted to, a dear friend, J.P. Moreland, calls this anti-intellectualism. He wrote... Anti-intellectualism has spawned an irrelevant gospel. Today, we share the gospel primarily as a means of addressing felt needs. Now, what JP means is this, is that our emotional life is valuable, but it's come at the cost of dumbing down the historic Christian faith. JP says that this has left the church anemic. Because if people don't think through what the Bible says, then guess what? The culture is going to fill the empty space by offering pat answers. So let me anticipate two objections. First is this. Doesn't the Bible in 1 Corinthians 8.1 tell us that knowledge puffs up? In other words, doesn't gaining knowledge make a person prideful? Yes. It does. It can and it does. And unfortunately, I've seen it in me and I've seen it in others. And it's ugly. It's ugly. Paul is not saying that all knowledge puffs up, but he's warning against an attitude toward knowledge as a way to gain power or inflate one's ego. This kind of arrogance has no place in the church. None at all. Well, what about Colossians 2.8, warning us not to be taken captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy that depends on worldly or human traditions and principles rather than on Christ? Again, it's not philosophy per se, but rather hollow or deceptive philosophy based on worldly traditions and principles rather than on Christ himself. Good philosophy that serves theology is important because it helps us root out bad philosophy, which infects so much of our modern culture today. So hear me well. I am not saying that everybody has to be a, a good Bible, a Bible scholar or a philosopher, or that everybody has to be like Paul when he's talking about all, to the Greeks about all these idols in Athens. Right? However, all of us can begin to think well about the Word of God. Do you have the passion of the Bereans when it comes to thinking and learning and grasping not only how accessible the gospel is, but how deep the gospel goes? Do you realize that you're going to spend the rest of your life understanding just how nuanced and complex and beautiful the gospel truly is. That takes thinking. So as an example, let's take Paul's prayer for the Ephesian church in Ephesians 3, 16 through 19. 
we read this. Paul writes, in part, to comprehend the length, the width, the height, the depth of God's love. That word comprehend is the same word that's used when Peter in Acts 10 saw God pouring out his spirit on the Gentiles. It's this. It's like, Peter, think through the implications of this. And so here's how you might start. Take a short passage of the Bible and read it slowly three times. Do not start in Leviticus. (laughs) Don't start in Leviticus. Listen, if it's not your practice to to read the Bible, start reading one of the gospel narratives, right? The the gospel of Matthew, of Mark, Luke, or John, these eyewitness accounts of Jesus. Because if that's not your habit, you want to get as much of Jesus as you can. Just read as much of Jesus as you can. Or Or start with the New Testament or a psalm. Then, as you read it slowly three times, underline what strikes you or leaps out at you. Take the word length of God's love in Ephesians 3 that I just read. What does this length of God's love look like in your life? What length did God go to save you? What length does he go to daily to shower his love and grace on you. Think it through. Think it through. Then write it down and ask three implications. Questions. Three implications. How does this lead me to worship God? How does this lead me to agree with God about a specific sin in my life? And third, how can this shape my character? Now, if you didn't get all of that, you can scan the QR code in the back seat in front of you, and you can have it right, as you walk out today. Think deeply, devotionally about God's Word. Be eager, passion, intense interest in God's Word. Examine, reflect, think. So let's keep reading. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed when he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with those who worship God, as well as in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also debated with him. Some said, what is this ignorant show-off trying to say? Others replied, he seems to be a preacher of foreign deities, d- deities Because he was telling the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. They took him and brought him to the Areopagus and said to him, May we learn about this new teaching you are presenting. Because what you say sounds strange to us. And we want to know what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners residing there spent their time on nothing else but telling or hearing something new. Paul stood in the middle of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that you are extremely religious in every respect. For as I was passing through and observing the objects of your worship, I even found an altar on which was inscribed to an unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, he is the Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by human hands, neither is he served by human hands or though he needed any, as though he needed anything since he himself gives everyone life and breath and all things. From one man he has made every nationality to live over the whole earth and has determined their appointed times and the boundaries of where they live. He did this so they might seek God and perhaps they might reach out and find him though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Since we are God's offspring, then we shouldn't think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image fashioned by human art and imagination. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God, God now commands all people everywhere to repent because he has set a day 
when he is going to judge the world in righteousness by the man he has appointed. He has provided proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some began to ridicule him. But others said, we'd like to hear from you again about this. So Paul left their, their presence. However, some people joined him and believed, including Dionysius, the Areopagite, and, uh, and a woman named Damaris and others with him. We looked at Acts 17 this past summer, so let me refer to you that if you want to hear more of the story in Acts 17 about Paul at uh, the Areopagus, there's a sermon titled, Is Christianity True? Let me simply point out a few things from uh, Paul's perspective. Just as Christianity think, uh, uh, means that we have to think devotionally, it also means that we have to think evangelistically as we rub shoulders with people who aren't Christian. Uh, when Paul came to Athens, as was his practice, he worse, first went to the Jewish synagogue. But then it, we read that every day he also went to the marketplace, the Greek agora, which was the center of life in Athens. Finance, education, art, government. It was a place where people gathered to talk about the latest news or philosophy as Athens was still the center of culture despite being ruled by the Romans. So Paul began to reason with the Jews at Mars Hill, the Areopagus, who eventually took him to the Areopagus Council made up of cultural and intellectual elites. We read both Stoics and Epicureans. Now, all you need to know today about these groups is they had different outlooks on life, the gods, people, and people. The fact of history is this. When Christianity grew, Stoicism and Epicureanism, even the pantheon of the Roman gods, vanished because people increasingly found these ways of thinking implausible because it left them with too many holes that they had to account for. The sociologist Peter Berger coined a phrase, plausibility structures. That is, the practices, institutions, and assumptions in a society that nudge those living in it to consider certain beliefs as plausible and others as implausible. It's the story or a narrative that people tell each other about what's plausible or believable. So if you visit Rome or Athens today, just you stand there and marvel at how old it is. But it begins to, it starts to sink in how radical this change was as people understood how unsatisfying and inconsistent how implausible these philosophies and the gods really were. In Peter Berger's words, they became implausible. When Paul arrived in Athens, we read that he saw. Now, if Luke wanted to say that he just saw with his eyes, he could have used the, word Greek, the Greek word blepo. Instead, Luke uses the word theoreo, meaning Paul theorized in his mind to see something underneath. And then he reasoned with them. That word reason means to dialogue or to ask thought-provoking questions, just like the Greek philosopher Socrates did. He didn't start by saying this confrontationally you bunch of dumb, wicked sinners. Like Paul, our approach should be thoughtful, theorizing what's underneath, what drives them. So our role in evangelism is often first asking questions to help people uncover these stories that they tell themselves about God, about themselves, about others, and life itself. 
and then to begin to explore any inconsistencies that arise. Just give you a quick example. One of the reasons I think why some people get really mad about Christianity and just walk away, even though they don't know it, or maybe are unwilling to admit it, is that they had a really hard experience in church. Like it was, it, it, it was ugly and it left a scar, right? And, and so sometimes when we talk to people who are belligerently against Christianity, sometimes just asking questions like, so what was your religious upbringing like? And if it comes out, the story comes out, just agreeing and saying, oh, I could see. So tell me, did, like, what did that make you feel like when you... And we just begin to talk with people and meet with them where they're at. But these are the stories that drive people. And because of that, their plausibility structure doesn't allow them to believe that Christianity could be plausible. It's implausible, not because of anything to do with Jesus, but only because of what they experienced in tremendous hurt through a church experience. Okay. Paul then offers a savvy observation. He says this, I see that you are quite religious. As he noticed an idol to an unknown God. As if the Greeks were trying to cover all their bases, right? And they threw in a God to worship just in case we missed one. Christopher Watkin writes, We might say in our modern secular time today, people of modernity or modern times, I see that in every way you think of yourself as very irreligious, but your irreligion is very Christian. Meaning this, you think of yourself as being somebody who's not shackled by, right, this like Christianity thing, right? So you think of yourself as irreligious, but your irreligion is more Christian than you realize. Watkin goes on to say this, that this is the great contradiction because while people treat Christianity coldly or antagonistically, they are unaware or unwilling to admit that they rely on it every day of their lives in their ethics and in their relationship. In other words, people can bag on Christianity publicly, but the truth is everybody is relying on it daily to determine their ethics and determine their relationships. Let me give you an example. John Somerville is a professor who had a class of students who were, you know, just like young people at college, right? Just very negative about Christianity. What they, these students didn't understand was how much their lives had been shaped by it and continued to be shaped by it. He offered this thought experiment. Do it with me, right? Do this thought experiment with me. Imagine you see a little old lady coming down the street at night and she's carrying a great big purse under her arm. And it occurs to you that she's tiny and old and it would be incredibly easy for you to knock her over, right? Knock her down and grab her purse. But you don't. Why not? Well, Somerville said there are two approaches. The first one is this. Before Christianity came, virtually all cultures were what's known as an honor-shame culture. The answer in an honor-shame culture is that you won't knock the little lady down and take her purse because that would make you a despicable person. You would be shamed by your friends because that's not strong behavior, that's weak. However, he added... In an honor-shame society, this approach means that you are thinking entirely of yourself, your honor, and your reputation. That's the first approach. Here's the second approach that would keep you from taking the purse. You imagine how hard it would be for her if she actually depended on that money in her purse. And you start to wonder, if I actually took the purse, knocked her down, if I mugged her, like what would happen to her? This is not a self-regarding ethic. You want the best for her. Now, Somerville said, class, how many of you would take the purse? 
Of course, nobody took the purse. But then he said, why not? What approach of the two would you use? Everybody. Everybody in the class, including his most secular students, said the second approach. He told them, well, you've been changed by Christianity because the origin of that idea that you put the other person ahead of yourself rather than thinking about your own honor, where did that come from? That came from Christianity. That is Christianity's gift to the world, one of the gifts. You unknowingly rely on the Christian gift to the world every day in small and big ways. That is what Watkin is saying is the great contradiction. As much as people are against religion today, they rely on it every day, every day. Then Paul, similar to Romans 1, says this, you know in your heart that this unknown God has to be big. I mean, even your own poets tell the story. You know this. He's a God who created everything. He's self-sufficient, meaning he doesn't need anything. He's sovereign over the affairs of people. He's not, ah, what am I going to do now? Well, I don't know. Only when you have a God this big can you rest from all of your rushing to get things done and grasping for life and always still feeling like it's just a step out of your reach. Only a God this big can provide hope in the face of sickness and death. Only a God this big can provide, uh, can help you stand in the most discouraging circumstances in life. Only a God this big can give you the power to do what is right in the face of evil. Only a God this big can love you because if you have a God who approves of everything that you do, that God is too small. If love, by definition, is costly, and I'm not talking about a Christian definition of love. Anybody who's thinking about love will know by definition, that love is costly. If love, by definition, is costly, then what did it cost your God to love you? The harsh reality is, is that when you have a small God, it's a God of your own making. And so when you adore that God, that small God, really what you're doing is you're loving yourself. So how can you know this big God? Dorothy Sayers was one of the first women who graduated from Oxford. She was a mystery writer who wrote the Peter Whimsey mystery novels. Peter was, an, was a great character, right? He was this aristocrat who solved murder mysteries, but he was also unmarried. At one point in the Whimsey uh, series, a woman character, a female character, suddenly showed up named Harriet Vane. She also was a mystery writer who also went to Oxford. Peter and Harriet fell in love, and they got married. Now, readers, as they were reading the Peter Whimsey mystery novels, as they looked back on it, they realized this, that Dorothy Sayers saw Peter as lonely, and so she wrote herself into her own stories so that she could rescue Peter, they would fall in love and live happily ever after. As romantic as that sounds, that is exactly what the Bible actually says happened in history. God looked down on the world that he created. And we have made such a mess of things in ourselves. He saw us sinking further and further into the mire of darkness and death. When Paul saw all the idols in Athens, he was distressed. Now, it doesn't, distress doesn't mean that Paul was mad and angry. 
Distress is a complex word. It, it means to be torn with strong contradictory feelings. The word is most associated in the Old Testament to describe how God felt when he saw his people worshiping foreign idols. It's a godlike jealousy in the best sense of jealousy that's full of love for people he, who, created, who he created who are bent on destroying themselves. And yet because of his eternal love for us, he wrote himself into the story. I love you too much to let you destroy yourself, so I'm coming to rescue you. Jesus went to the cross to die for us. And then he rose again on the third day. And when you see that God has always been a part of that story, your story, and what he did to rescue you through Christ's work, that's the beginning of knowing him personally. Think that through. What does that mean in my life? 